Good morning. It's my honor to be here to talk to the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Bob Corker of Texas, the architect. Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee, yes, sorry. Yeah, that's right. We all know Texas would yeah. not exist without Tennessee. That's right. Not from Tennessee, so. Hence my confusion. Yeah, yeah, there you go. An architect of the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act. We want to talk about that and what's next for the Iran deal, but first touch on some hot spots. And I think we have to start with the situation in Syria. We heard President Obama at the UN this week talk about a managed transition for the Assad regime in Syria, a very different tone than he's taken previously when he said Assad had to go. Is there a shift in U.S. policy here? And if so, it, does it strike you as a, as a smart thing for the United States to do mm -hmm. to accept Assad as the leader of Syria because of the battle against ISIS? Well, I don't think there's any question, but there continues to be an evolution. Um, you know, Assad is the singular pull for ISIS in the region, and so to consider that you're going to try to deal with ISIS and leave Assad in place is something that uh, creates quite a conflict, if you will, of, of goals. If you look at what's happening there, um, we had a hearing yesterday, and of course I think all of us uh, see the tragedy of uh, what has occurred in many ways. Um, we, have, we are reaping right now what we sowed as we were talking backstage. But during the Yugoslav 10-year episode, 140,000 people were killed. Four million people were displaced, and we've already blown by those numbers in a very short time in Syria where at least 240,000 people are dead and 11 million people displaced. So this is a human tragedy of epic proportions, the, the biggest since World War II. And obviously we've missed opportunities at times when it was evident we could make a difference relative to what's happened on the ground. We've missed those opportunities, particularly in August and September of 2013. There was bipartisan support for a 10-hour operation, a 10-hour operation, uh, no boots on the ground, no flights over Syria, that could have really changed the momentum at a time when we really did have a moderate opposition that existed. And then after that, there were opportunities for us to, to do some things to support them in an appropriate way. You remember the gentleman named General Idris that we never supported. And then I know there have been decision memos after decision memos on the president's death to deal with an air exclusion zone on the border of Turkey, which would have served two purposes, and that is to seal the border of Turkey. Uh, people are flying into Istanbul and making their way into Turkey and then down into Syria and Iraq. So we could have sealed the border and at the same time provided a place uh, for humanitarian aid uh, to be given inside the country. So as we continue to miss opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, no doubt things are evolving. And, you know, one thing you have to say about uh, Putin um, is uh, he, knowing that he's going to get no pushback, uh, just continues to thrust out. We visit people in the region, Susan, uh, all the time. And, they recite conversations that they have one-on-one -on -one with him, and they ask him why he's been so overt in his foreign policy with so many domestic issues within the country, within his own country. And he sees no pushback, no price to pay. As a matter of fact, what it's doing is raising his popularity within the country as they see Russia coming back into greatness from their own perspective. So um, that's continuing right now on the ground. Uh, it's continuing in the air in, in uh, Syria, and uh, we continue to let things evolve and take their own course, and, and yes, things are changing. And I don't know where this goes with, with Russia and with Iran, but it's evident we're at least open to discussing uh, the future with them. Thinking about the changing role of Russia reports just this morning that Russian warplanes have begun bombing targets in Syria. Should we have any U.S. pushback to that, or should we view that as a good thing, a helpful thing? Well, we've received early reporting this morning, and I don't know if it's true or not, but, you know, we've received reporting that even instead of just targeting ISIS, we've received reports, uh, some people in the audits can verify whether this is true or not, that they're even hitting rebel camps, in other words, not people affiliated with ISIS. So, um, look, I... Uh, uh, obviously, things have to be deconflicted. I'm still hopeful. I'm still hopeful that somehow or another, 
us and other Western friends and, and Sunni allies in the region will do something to create areas within Syria uh, where humanitarian aid can be given and where you can begin to coalesce a taking back of territory by those people that are not extreme. But uh, um, I see as things evolve that uh, it's unlikely the administration is going to take steps to do that. You know, critics say oh, President Obama has mishandled the situation in Syria from the start. People, defenders of the president say an impossible situation destined to uh, degenerate, uh, not something the United, under U.S. control under any yeah. circumstances. Where do you view, where do you, what do you view of that? Well, you know, I, I, I look at, uh, I mean, I read those stories this morning, uh, and I know there's, uh, look, I mean, there's always going to be a divergence of opinion on this. I still believe that during that time frame in August, September of 2013, where there was a moment, an opportunity, during a 10-hour operation, again, I want to make sure people understand that, to, to really degrade his ability to deliver chemical weapons from the air, uh, by the way, which would have helped degrade his ability to deliver uh, the barrel bombs that are being delivered now. But there was a moment, in a moment where there was some momentum momentum by the, by, by the Free Syrian Army, and it was real, and I don't think anybody would debate that. It was real, and so by us not taking that action, um, they lost, I mean, it took the wind out of their sails. We didn't push back, obviously, figuratively. We jumped in Putin's lap to deal with the chemical weapons issue, and of course, if you listen to the administration now, they talk about the fact that we've done away with all the declared weapons, I mean, obviously, Assad has not declared all of We know he's using chemical weapons now against his, uh, his own citizens. So I think that was the biggest moment of opportunity. I think it was mishandled. Uh, and in fairness, uh, our friends in Europe mishandled it also. Uh, the British Parliament, as you remember, uh, uh, Cameron took it to them. They pushed back. Uh, I think that created some uh, consternation on behalf of the president and the administration. But... You know, again, the West, our friends in Europe and ourselves, uh, let's face it, uh, at a time when we could have taken some action that would have made a difference, in my opinion, and in most people's opinion, we didn't. But I'll also say something else that's really been damaging. We lost so much credibility. Um, I, I, I'm in the region constantly. It, it hurt us significantly as far as people believing they could rely on what we as a country say. I stood with the president. Um, I believe when the president says that there's a red line on behalf of our nation, it's something that whether you're Republican or Democrat, uh, you should stand behind. I did it in committee. We passed an authorization for the use of military force. Uh, during a recess period, we came back, I think a high moment of the Foreign Relations Committee, and we didn't take those steps. One of the terrible consequences of the turmoil in Syria is this flood of refugees we see in Europe. Given um, our role in the world and also our role in this particular conflict, does the United States have an obligation to do more to address this crisis, not only including sending money and aid, but also in accepting a significantly increased number of Syrian refugees? So look, we, uh, we are certainly the largest contributor of aid, and I think people understand that. Um, the countries together, all together in Europe now have just surpassed us, but as a country, we are the largest contributor. We are the largest taker of refugees each year. We take in 70,000 each year. Uh, what the administration has proposed is that next year we take in 85,000 instead of 70, and the next year we take in 100 instead of 85. Congress will look at that, and my guess is, uh, assuming we feel like the vetting can take place in an appropriate way, um, it, the likelihood is it'll be supported. But it, it really is almost a facade, because think about it. I mean, 11 million people are displaced. Millions of people are flooding into Europe. We're talking about dealing, we're not looking, we're not dealing with the people you're seeing on the TV screens. I think people should understand this is a huge disconnect. I mean, it takes us 18 months to two years to, to actually vet people and bring them in. And the amount of Syrians that will be part of that 85,000 number is like 2,500, it's a very small number. So at the end of the day, uh, what we, you would think that we and others would want to do, these, are, these Syrians are people just like you and I. They, 
They want to raise their families in dignity. They, they have visions of hope for the future, just like people in this audience. And you would think that we would try to deal with the root cause. In other words, instead of this pittance that's occurring relative to people actually being brought in because of just the procedures that take place, you would think that we would want to deal with the root cause on the ground. And so that's why it's even more troubling when you see Russia saying they're going to support Assad. When you say Iran, when you see Iran immediately after the nuclear deal announcing that no foreign entity will come in and change the dynamic on the ground, when you know that he is the root cause of all of this occurring, that he is the one that today, while we sit here in his own prison camps, is torturing people in manners that I've stopped saying in public because it's so grotesque, but these are the kind of things that took place a thousand years ago, and yet he is inflicting that today as we sit here in this nice theater. He's doing that. And so, you know, I would hope that our efforts would be more towards dealing with Syria in such a fashion that Syrians can live in their own country. Let's talk briefly about Afghanistan. In recent days, the Taliban have captured control of a provincial capital in the north. It's their biggest military victory in a decade. Uh, we now have U.S. War, war planes bombarding the Taliban positions. Does this mean that the United States should reconsider the plan to withdraw most U.S. forces from Afghanistan by the end of next year? Given the lessons of Iraq, is it going to be necessary for us to make a longer-term commitment of a significant number of U.S. forces there? Well, certainly, uh, you know, this, this was a major change on the ground. I mean, we haven't had this type of activity in a long time in Afghanistan. And certainly uh, the military folks on the ground uh, understand that if we take it down to three or 4,000 troops, all they really are doing is, we understand the military has a huge footprint when people are there, thankfully. I mean, they're there to protect their own people. That's their first concern, is to ensure that when we send people overseas, we have the ability to protect them, to care for them if they have injuries, uh, all that it takes a big footprint. And so if you take it down to three or 4,000, which I know has been contemplated, all you're really doing is they're protecting yourself. So I think we do have to rethink that. And uh, obviously the, the turn of events and the, the ground that's being gained by the Taliban is, is obviously hugely disappointing. But uh, I, I think, you know, um, we have to rethink it as we see the momentum that's taking place on the ground. All the money we've invested there, all the human resources, all the casualties U.S. forces have taken in Afghanistan, wh why, how does anything change? So that when we look forward, yeah. whenever we, presumably if one day we do withdraw, yeah. how can we make things different there? If all yeah, this look, it's, uh, you know, I've visited uh, where we've been training uh, Afghans, same thing in Iraq, and look, I'll tell you, it's pretty... And when you look at the caliber of people that we're training and their allegiance to really deal with the issues, uh, it's pretty disheartening to see the amount of dollars that is spent in those type of training operations. And when you see sometimes that we care more about uh, what happens uh, relative to, uh, you know, things on the ground than they do, that's very disheartening. I think that you know, Colin Powell, certainly uh, the statement that uh, if you break it, you own it. I know he's going to be here a little bit later. I think that our nation and others have learned a great deal from that. But I think there's also something to be learned from breaking it and leaving it, uh, which is what, you know, the administration did in Libya. So, um, you know, we've got to, uh, 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 we, we're in it. Uh, we uh, obviously the footprint is majorly different the casualties really uh, to, very, to a very small degree are being taken on right now and I think a little bit more patience and persistence is warranted with the changes that are taking place you did the impossible you negotiated a bipartisan bill that got through the Senate in veto proof numbers uh, the, to, to provide for a congressional review of the Iran nuclear deal. Now, in the end, uh, you were unable to, you, you supported a resolution of disapproval, unable to get a vote on that because yeah. Democrats filibustered it. But looking back, did you achieve what you'd hoped to achieve when you, when you devised that bill? Yeah. So you have to remember when we devised the bill, none of us had any idea most of us, some people had already made up their minds, but most of us who negotiated this bill had no idea what the agreement was going to say. It was a, if you look at where we've been in, in the United States, 
the executive branch has really consumed power away from the legislative branch. And most people, you know, this has eroded over time. And so, yes, it was an effort to bring power back. The president decided that he was going to negotiate an executive agreement. Uh, for those of you who don't do this on a daily basis, what that means is he can decide and it doesn't have the force of power after he leaves. But that's the way most presidents are doing things now, to keep from coming to Congress. There's a second step called a congressional executive agreement, which does become a law. The strongest is a treaty, and many presidents are moving away from those types of agreements. And in this case, the president, as you know, was going to go straight to the UN Security Council without congressional approval. Because Congress had played such a role in bringing Iran to the table, we, fa we passed four tranches of sanctions that many people believe were the most crippling sanctions. And so because we had played that role, I was able to convince, thankfully, uh, people on the other side of the aisle that it was appropriate that before those sanctions were relieved, even though he had a national security waiver and he had planned to use it when he went to the UN Security Council, that it was appropriate for us to be able to at least have a vote of approval or disapproval, but to see the agreement, to see all the classified annexes, let it lay before Congress. And so, yes, we achieved a step in the legislative branch beginning to take back power. Uh, the American people understand this agreement probably more than any agreement uh, that has taken place in modern time. Only 21% of the people in our country approve of it per pew. Uh, but the fact is we understand it. The, the other aspect, I know it's a long-winded answer and I apologize, but now the agreement is obviously going to take place. Um, the other pieces of this is it gives Congress a role in oversight. If you look at what's happened in North Korea, a deal was done, nobody paid any attention, they have nuclear weapons. Um, this, this agreement uh, gives us, first of all, the president has to certify every 90 days that Iran is in compliance. There's a whole host of documents that have to be given to us on a six-month basis, so it keeps us in this, if you will, in an oversight capacity for some period of time, for, forever. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Senator Bob Corker, thanks so much Thank for joining you. us. Thank you so much.